is going to be sharing the word of the Lord with us today. Good morning. I heard that. <laughs> well, I think I'm probably the fourth person from the stage to tell you Happy Father's Day, but I got to do it anyway, right? So Happy Father's Day. Could all the fathers in the house please stand up right now? I'd like you to stand to your feet. It's good for us to honor these men. Zeta didn't know you were a father. And, and Catherine, too. I didn't know you were a father also. But <laughs> I don't know if you're paying attention, but there was a father that just stood up here and paced back and forth a little bit ago. All you young men looking to be fathers, there's one standing right back there now. Pay attention. All right. Well, <clears throat> welcome to Father's Day. This is a special day for me. I really I love this day. It was about seven years ago, most of you weren't here, but some of you were, that I believe I stood on that balcony there and declared that it was my first Father's Day because Katie was pregnant with Jack. So seven years have come a long way. Uh, some of you know the, the difficulties that we had with both pregnancies with our boys. Uh, many of you walked through that with us, and almost all of you have met our boys. They are fantastic young men. I'm excited for what God has for them. But this process of fathering is incredibly challenging. It is not for the faint of heart. If you're to do it well, you leave skin in the game. I remember when I first saw Jack, I cried. I cried. When I heard his voice after the long road we'd had getting him to us, I remember just weeping, thanking the Lord that he was there. And it is amazing. If you're not a parent yet, but parents you know, that instant you see that baby, your heart is full of love. Love you have never experienced before in your life. Everyone else, you get to choose to love. Right? You make a choice. Husbands and wives, you get to make a choice whether you're going to love that other person. When you fall in love, that's a choice. But when you have a child, that love comes from somewhere else. It's an incredible thing. The reality of being a father is a wholly different thing. <laughs> that one kind of tends to smack you upside the back of your head, kind of like the NCIS, you know, slap. <laughs> it's, it's incredible how the reality of that just begins to unfold in your life. You realize now you are more responsible for more, for more people than you've ever thought you could be in your life. And you care about them, and you realize that your actions play out into their lives. It's a fascinating thing. You Suddenly you start caring about the world a whole lot more because your babies are being influenced by it. Now, <clears throat> there's a, a really great recognition that we need grace in fathering because we do not get this thing right a lot of the time. I know for myself, I thought I knew a whole lot about fathering before I got started, and I'm still a young dad, and I there's, know there's a whole lot more to learn. I don't have teenagers yet, so talk to me in about 10 years, and we can, <laughs> I'm sure I'll have a different perspective at that point in time. But even in these seven years, my entire life has changed. My outlook on things has completely shifted, and I realize how often I fail. I realize how often I try and I just fail. And it's not always about getting it right. It's that continual pursuit of, of growing, of learning, of trying. And you have to have a vision for where you're going. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Now every time I get up here, I tend to point back to the sign that's behind me. Putting the Father on display. I spent a good amount of time considering that sign back there. What does that actually mean? As a father myself, I look at it and I think, what am I putting on display? What am I passing on to my sons? What am I passing on to the world around me? 
and am I living that back there? You know, we're really familiar with the notion that you can see the characteristics of mothers and fathers and their kids is that I've seen your dad do that. Or, you look just like your mom. Oh, no. (laughs) But we see characteristics passed down from fathers to sons, from moms and dads to their kids. We even see in, in households, there's qualities that come out. I don't know if you all know this, but our worship team today was like 50% or more made up by the Monday family. All right? I've, when I first got here, these kids were about this tall. And, uh, and Bethany, I'm going to embarrass you here for a second. <laughs> Bethany referred to me as Mr. Dude. <laughs> because her dad called me Dude. <laughs> Now, she invited me to her, I believe it was her fifth birthday at the time, and uh, you know, what a fabulous young lady she's turned into. <clears throat> but Beth and Brandon have a heart after worship. They have invested their talents, and they have grown so much. It has just been incredible, but it's coming forth in fruit in their kids. Paul... And Bethany and Joshua do not sound like Beth and Brandon, right? Completely different worship style, completely different likes and songs, all that kind of stuff. But you know what you see? You see that heart of worship being carried forward into another generation. It's incredible. Now, Joshua was not up here during the service. When most of you weren't here, he was up here testing out the the piano for his dad so he could have some sound to play to test out our, our sound equipment. But what was coming out of him in that was fantastic. So, parents, what you do for your kids by setting an example for them is very, very important. Now, we are just beginning to plumb the depths of this statement behind me. What does it mean? How far-reaching is it? How do I put the Father on display? What is it about him that I need to put on display? What does he want to display through me? Clearly, this is important to this body of people. Several years ago, we changed our name from Patuxent River Assembly of God to Our Father's House. We've been imprinting this on ourselves. We realized how much we identified with this message that we are sons, and that we have a loving Heavenly Father, that we are to represent Him here in time and space. It's the expressed hope of this people that God would put Himself on display to the world through us. And we're talking about a change of mindset that brings about a change in heart in us, that brings about a change in the culture. And I'm not talking about a just a culture within these four walls. I'm talking about the culture, a change in the culture. It gets incubated here. But how does that happen? How do we get from here, or from where we were, to the mental ascent to some concepts that we've been exposed to, or maybe we've even experienced? And we have a father in this house, Lanny Clark, is a spiritual father to many people here in this house, including myself. Many of us have had that example um, live in our lives. How do we get from that to transforming not just our generation, but the generations that come after us? If we really see this vision and we want to see this change the world, how does that happen? How does it get from them to out there? Putting the Father on display. I believe the answer is in that statement back there. Ladies, I hope you'll oblige me, but I'm going to preach to the men today. Okay with that? (laughs) I'm here to preach to the men today. Guys, All who are in the body of Christ are called son by God, regardless of your gender, because he is the father of your spirit. 
but our gender does carry with it representational value here in time and space. As men, there are certain characteristics of God that we are given to steward. Probably the most vital, though, is Father. Guys, this is quite possibly one of the greatest roles you will ever play in your life. When, God's, when done God's way, it will transform you in ways you cannot possibly imagine. Now, we're familiar with the idea that <clears throat> you get your image of Father God often from your father. If your dad was abusive, we see God as an abusive father. If he was loving, we see God as a loving father. But that imprint and that mental image of what father means comes from how you act and what you do. That is a very high responsibility, and God takes it very seriously. God the Father is perfect love, and his love has to transform us. It is God's intent that we rule on his behalf but not as dominators of those who are subject to our rule. He's placed people under our care. Now, as rulers, like I said, we're not supposed to be dominators. We are supposed to be a standard of rule, more like a 12-inch stick. It's something to be measured against. It's an example of what is there, what truth is. Now, if we ever hope to see the nature of God, the Father, put on display in the generations to follow us, it is upon us to begin to set the example for them. The Word must become incarnate in us first for it to bear fruit in the following generations. It has to become incarnate in us. It has to live in us. It has to be real in and through us. So what does that require? It requires that we go first. So let's talk about being a husband for a bit. <clears throat> Guys, being a good father is not a standalone thing. It's not a standalone relational quality that you can have in your life. That means if we want to be the best father we can be, you can't be a terrible husband, you can't be a terrible friend. You can't be a terrible son and expect that that's something that's going to come across and shine. We are integral people. We have to have integrity through and through. Amongst other things, son, brother, and friend, being a godly husband is chiefly important. To be a father who accurately represents your heavenly father, you have to work at all of these relationships. Integrity means that you are the same through and through. But that being said, your relationship with your wife is the most important relationship that you have here with another human. If you don't focus on your relationship with your wife, you're doing your children a disservice. Because your home has to be a safe place for them. You have to model for them what it is to be a good husband, what it is to have, be loved by a man. This relationship is paramount in your life and it is incredibly important as your development as a father. So let's dig into this a little bit because I believe it sets the stage for where we're going. <clears throat> now this next section, I'll admit openly, did not come from me. I did not elucidate these ideas. My spiritual father did, okay? One of the benefits of having a spiritual father as a son is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. I just get to put new tires on it so we can go in a different direction. A first principle of husbanding is the recognition that from the eternal point, God places the male expression of, his, of himself as the head in the male-female relationship. So we have a passage to look at, and ladies, I think you're probably starting to get a little bit nervous, right? <laughs> 1 Corinthians 11.3 But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. 
Now, this is a great scripture that we have used to subjugate women for centuries. We are the head. We have everything. We know it all. We're the ones that have all the authority in the world. <clears throat> I'm going to discuss that with you. <clears throat> in answering the obvious question, the key word here is head. There are two Greek words that require our attention. One is arche, and the other is kephale. In English, the word head literally means the physical head of one's body, and figuratively, the leader of a body of people. The two meanings are intertwined, but this isn't the same thing in Greek. Okay? Where two different and distinct words are translated into English as the word head. So, one of the words, arche, means head in terms of leadership or point of origin. It was used to denote beginning in the sense of first or point of inception. And we use this Greek word as a prefix in terms like archaeology, archetype, archives, all relating to old or first things, just as it was used to denote point of origin. Arche was also used to denote first in terms of importance and power. Does that start to sound familiar to you? We use it as a prefix in words such as archangel, archbishop, archenemy, archduke, and so on, all relating to the head of a group in terms of leadership. Forms of arch, arche are used throughout the New Testament, including the writings of Paul to designate the head or ruler of a group of people. These forms are translated magistrate, chief, prince, ruler, head, and so forth. However, you might find it interesting that Paul did not choose to use that word here. He used a different term. By the way, Paul's a native Greek speaker. He was born in Tarsus. He spoke both Greek and Hebrew. But this is his language, so I think he knows it pretty well. Okay? Instead, Paul chose to use the word kephale. This word does mean head, the part of one's body. But it also means foremost in terms of position, as a capstone over a door or a cornerstone in the foundation. It was never used to mean leader or boss or chief or ruler. Kephale is also a military term, guys. It means one who leads, but not in the way that we're familiar with as director, general, or captain, or someone who orders the troops from a safe distance. It's quite the opposite. Kephale, a kephale, was one who went into battle before the troops. The leader in the sense of being in the lead, the first one into battle. In other words, the kephale is the one who sets the example, the one who goes first in order to lead the other. Did it settle on in? Because this is a change in your understanding of what this verse means. The husband is not the arche, the one who gives orders and commands to the life of the other. The husband is the kephale, the one who sets the example and leads the way for the others. In the realm of eternity, Revelation 1.5 calls Jesus the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler, archon, of the kings of the earth. Additionally, both 1 John 1.1 1, 1 and Revelation 3.14 identify Jesus as the eternally preexistent arche. Note that in Colossians 1.8, Jesus is both the kephale of the body and the arche, first in order and power from the dead. <clears throat> Colossians 1.18, he is also kephale of the body, the church, and he is beginning arche, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. However, within time and space, Jesus commanded us in this fashion. Matthew 20, 25 through 26, but Jesus called them to himself and said, I know that there are rulers, archon, of the Gentiles who lorded over you, and their men 
exercise authority over them. It is not this way for you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be a servant. So let's go back and read that scripture again with our new understanding of what that means. Okay? But I want you to understand that Christ is the kephale of every man, and the man is the kephale of a woman, and God is the kephale of Christ. You see the pattern? For our purposes, then, to be the head is to set the example by going first, guys. Let's take a little sidebar here, because it's a corollary to righteous headship. Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being savior of the body. So what does it mean to be subject? <clears throat> Paul makes the appeal for the wife to voluntarily yield leadership of her life to the one who sets the example by going first. So let's reconsider the kingdom order in 1 Corinthians 11.3. God is the head of Christ, Christ the head of man, and man the head of the wife. If the husband stops setting the example by going first, then the condition of voluntarily yielding to the leadership of her life passes to the son and the father. The wife is not obligated to submit simply because an immature husband demands it. God cares more about her than you care about her whether you're righteous or not, okay? Is this sinking in for you guys? You just lost your position of rulership, of (laughs) dominion, okay? That's been deconstructed. That's not what, that's not what was intended by this, this scripture at all. At this time in history, Male-dominated society is already well established, okay? <clears throat> Paul didn't come to reaffirm that. He came and tore that thing apart. When he said these things to the Greeks, they understood what it meant, okay? So this is very significant. Guys, we're instructed to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Wait, didn't Christ die for us? Didn't he lay down his life for us? How do we as men love our wives and our families by sacrificing ourselves and going first by leading the way into the fray. That's how we show love. It's not just the hugs and kisses and nice words. It is by leading the way, by putting our skin on the line for them day in and day out. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Are you willing to lay down your life on a daily basis? Are you willing to get rid of your priorities and reprioritize your family before yourself? Are you willing to lead with the example that Christ led with? Are you willing? I'm talking to men today, but there's some men here on the front row here. Pay attention, young men, because your turn's coming soon. Grab hold of these truths now because it's going to be easier for you in the long run. We have to be willing to submit our lives to the Lord completely. We have to surrender every part of our lives over to Him. And then we have to keep surrendering every part of our lives over to Him. You don't need just a Savior for your soul. You need a Savior when you're on the computer. You need a Savior when you're in the car. You need a Savior when you're in that meeting. You need your Savior when you're talking to people. You need a Savior before you go to sleep at night. He needs to be Lord and King over your entire lives, men. And you are supposed to look like Him. That's a tall order. I'm not talking about cushy Christianity here. I'm not talking about a Sunday morning Christianity. I'm not talking about all the nice platitudes that we can tell each other. How you doing, brother? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Yeah? Oh, yeah, I'm blessed, brother. I am blessed. When really things are falling down around your ears. Where's your relationship? I'm talking about a radical lifestyle alteration here. 
a remapping of who you are. Did you know that our Lord is not a tame choir boy? Right? Thank God. He is not a tame choir boy. He is not a tame lion. We get this idea that we have this nice, pious Jesus who has the kind face. He's always holding the children. He's always very peaceful. Man, that guy kicked over tables. He kicked his sand in the eyes of Pharisees and people. He was poking his eye in society at that time. He was tearing down their constructs. Do you think they really put somebody on the cross because he was a nice guy? No, he threatened to tear down the temple and rebuild it. Holy cow. He was going after all their sacred cows. <laughs> right? He was going after everything. Do you think God just really wants you to be just a really nice guy? You know, as guys, we come into church. I, thankfully for me, this happened for me when I was a little kid because as a man coming into church the first few times, hearing us sing about how we love this man and how we want to have a sloppy wet kiss from him and all this kind of stuff, that'd be hard to palate, okay? <laughs> These are major, major transitions for a man to get from where we are to there because that's not how we are naturally designed to respond, okay? Guys, I will tell you that Jesus was not just a really nice guy. He is a warrior king. He is the warrior king. He went behind enemy lines to rescue his people, and they didn't even recognize him. This guy, he's pretty serious, all right? He is tough, and he's also tender because he comes from a place of strength. He was completely confident in who he is. You know, before he went to the cross, when Jesus was out doing all of his stuff, he was never reactionary to anything that took place. I mean, think about all the times the Pharisees and the Sadducees tried to trap him. They tried to get him to say the wrong thing so they could point their finger at him, right? He knew all their schemes. He just sidestepped every trap that they had. He laid traps for them. He was never reactionary. He was purposeful in everything that he did. If you're looking for somebody to emulate, I suggest you found him. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, this is not kind, gentle Jesus. This is warrior king Jesus who's calling you on mission with him. And that's what he did when he was here. How else are 12 guys that are come from all sorts of different walks of life going to follow a carpenter? Thinking that he's going to take down what they know at that time? Who he was and who he is is just incredibly, incredibly revolutionary. So guys, come up. Come up. Are you ready to step into a new way of life? Are you willing to allow him to transform you? Did you know that it used to be that men would contend to be the first in battle? They used to contend for the position to be on the front line. That's that foreign idea for us. We all want to be safe somehow. We want the other guy to go first. Not contend to be the one that gets shot at first. But that's the heart of God. That's the heart of the Father. That's Jesus. He says, let me go first. Let me take the blow. Let me soften this thing so the others can come through. That's him. We shy away from stuff. Are you ready to allow him to transform you? Are you ready to be challenged by him daily? Are you ready to be lifted to a different place in, in your existence? Calm down for just one second. Okay. You know, guys, there's men like Sam Solon and Lanny Clark who have become 
first generation in the pursuit of this father-son culture. The things that they have been exposing us to, and they're not the only ones, but they're people that we know personally, the things that they have been, been exposing us to is prototypical of what God wants to be doing in the earth. Okay? They're that first generation. They're the ones that are showing us the promised land. They're the ones that are giving us that promise. They can see it, and they can tell us what it is. But they're not the ones that are going to take it. They are not the ones that are going to take it. They're the first generation. Many of us have experienced the blessings of those prototypical journeys. But that land still has to be taken. It says, since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God has suffered violence, and violent men take it by force. Are you willing to pull down that reality in heaven here into time and space? To grab hold of that thing. It's for our generation to take that land. And for that, we need fathers. We need true, accurate fathers. Representing the Most High. Putting Him on display. Representing His interests in, chi- in time and place. Changing the culture. Changing the culture. Now, for this to happen, we have to have a culture of fathers, a community of fathers, not just one guy, not just two guys. We need a bunch of guys, all right? I believe that community that we're talking about is called brother, a brotherhood of fathers. Because, guys, no man can do it alone. That foundational community where that culture gets incubated has to be with men, and it has to be fathers. We call that brother. Brothers who are husbands, fathers, sons, friends, men. I'm talking real men, authentic men. Not the weakling, not the guy who's way too strong. Men, knowing their weaknesses, willing to understand that, but prepared to move forward. Men seeking hard after and pursuing God to bring them into accurate alignment with what, who he is and who he made them to be in time and space. Incarnate represent, representations of who he is. Men who are life-giving conduits of God's grace to their families and their communities. Men who allow God to reshape the environments around them through them. Men who recognize their own weaknesses and know that they can't do it alone, but in relationship with other men, but most importantly, a loving Heavenly Father who has called each one of them to a purpose. Each one of them to a purpose, and each one of them to a specific position in His mission for this planet. We need men who are bold and courageous. Not because of who they are and what they have inside of them, but because of whose they are and who they have inside of them. You're not strong because of you. You're strong because of him. In your weakness is where he's made strong. And who is it that we're putting on display? It's him, not you, him. As it's been said here recently, changing a culture is quite possibly the most difficult thing we could hope to accomplish. Changing a culture. And fortunately, changing a culture is not our idea, it's God's idea. Because he's the one that's going to do it through us. We can't do this alone, guys. We need brothers. A brother has your back. He pulls you back on course. When you fall down, he's willing to climb down in the mud with you and pull you back on the trail. 
getting himself dirty in the meantime. He sticks with you. He is your keeper. And you are your brother's keeper. God is intensely serious about this. It is so important to him. The first murder happened between brothers. The enemy of your soul hates sons. He hates brothers. He wants to fracture that relationship. Why do you think we're so isolated, guys? Why do you think we have such a hard time being intimate with other men and telling them, man, I'm struggling with this? Do you know what type of release happens for you when you just reach out to another man? The enemy doesn't want you to know that. If I'm struggling with an addiction and I text my, my brother, hey, I am having a hard time right now. Guess what's going to happen? 99% of that pressure you just felt is gone immediately because you allowed light to shine in on what was happening there. You reached out to your brother and you know that he's got your back. It's not like, I'm going to do it in the next five seconds if you don't text me back, right? You send that message, it's done. Wait for him to respond to you because he'll pray with you. He'll bring you through it. We need a brother. I believe God wants us to reclaim what the enemy stole in that first murder. I, want, I think he's wanting us to restore that, guys. If this thing is ever to succeed, we need a culture of brothers. I got a... <clears throat> music video we're going to have play here. It's a song that, uh, man, it gets me. And there's some amazing imagery in it. It's a song by a band called Need to Breathe. Many of you know them. You've probably heard this song on the radio. I want you to try to listen to the words. Sometimes they can be hard to understand. But I want you to try to listen to these words and understand what it is to be a brother. Let's roll it. you don't know, Bo and Bear are brothers. Now I have several brothers. One is by blood. I have several others. <clears throat> by the way, this message <clears throat> that you're listening to right now is called Head First Christianity. Etch a sketch. <laughs> We're reclaiming terms and phrases that we've come to understand one way. I believe head first Christianity by the man going first and leading the way is really what we're talking about here as far as needing a change in culture. <clears throat> one of my brothers, Brandon Nickish, and I have been pondering these things for a good long while. And I'm announcing right now that this is just the first installment in a, a couple of series about this. Brandon and I... <clears throat> You know, Brandon and I are very different. We have different personalities. He's taller, I'm shorter, he has hair, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but we have the same heart. We have the same heart. We want to see a transformation in this culture. So he and I are actually going to team teach a series on this. Okay, so you'll be seeing that coming in the near future. So <clears throat> something to look forward to. Who are the Joshua's and the Caleb's among us? The men who went into the promised land, tasted its fruit, and came back with the only good report of the whole bunch. The ones who said, we should go up and take possession of this land. 
for we can certainly do it. Nobody listened to them. When they began to rebel, these guys tore their clothes and they said, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people in the land because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid. Those guys stood up against an entire nation and said those things. Do you know that they wanted to stone them? But God said, all the rest of y'all, you're not going to the promised land. These two have my heart, and I'm bringing them in. And when they went in, Caleb asked God for the high places. He'd been waiting 40 years in the desert. He says, Lord, I want the high places in that land. And it was given to him. Who's going to take possession of that land? Who has that heart after God? Like David, who as a kid said, who is this Philistine who blasphemes against God? I'll go out and kill him. And wait a second, you're a shepherd boy. Yep, you know what? I killed lions and I killed bears when they came after my sheep. And God gave me strength then. I'll kill this Philistine too. Again, an entire nation of men unwilling to go. And it took one man who had a heart after God. So who are the men that have that heart after God that are willing to go and possess this land? Because this is not going to be an easy thing, changing a culture. It has to start here first. You need brothers. But who are the men that are going to be able to stand up? Who's ready to allow him to transform you? I'll issue a warning right now. This is not for the faint of heart. Are you willing for him to transform you? That means, you, guys, you've got to be willing to give up what you're carrying. You've got to be willing to lay it down time and time again. It's not for the faint at heart. There will be adversity in changing culture because the culture is set against you. I don't know how many times you've probably heard it, but they don't like guys. They want you to be a buffoon. They want you to be irresponsible. Unfortunately, we've given them a lot of fodder. <laughs> but that's not who God made us to be. We're set in adversity against this. When you're changing culture, you're in constant adversity. But I have it on good authority that a brother is made for adversity. And you can see that as me and my brother are always knocking heads. Or you can see it as we're back to back. We're facing the world together. We were built for adversity. And again, we have this promise, that there is a friend who is closer than a brother. And that's Jesus Christ. So, men, if you felt the Lord challenging you this morning, and there's something that's resonating within you that says, I want more than who I am right now. Because I know I want more than who I am right now. I'm not satisfied with who I am. I'm satisfied with who he is. And I want to be in that place where, like Tim said about his father, that he was a good and faithful servant. I want that, not just for me. I want that for my sons. I want that for my daughters. I want that for not just our community, but our entire world, our culture, to understand what a true man is as we lead them toward accurate representation of the Father. So, guys, if you... If you feel that call this morning, if you're resonating with that, I'd like you to stand up and come forward. If you want to be part of what God's doing to change a culture, I'd like you to come stand forward. Again, I'm going to warn you, this ain't easy. This is not for the faint of heart. God's going to test us. He's going to try us. This is a multi-generational thing. You might not be a father yet. You might be a kid but God wants to do something with you. He wants to transform you. Ladies, you're seeing who's standing up here, right? <laughs> I believe most of these belong to one of you. <laughs> it's going to be important for you to give them support. They need that comfort from you. They need that strength that you provide. These men are going to be 
wrestling with things in their souls as they attempt to follow the Lord. So please be praying for them. Please offer them your grace and your wisdom. Men, listen to them. God gave you a helpmate. Okay? Her gifts are for you because you got a blind side. Father, I thank you for these men. I thank you for what you've called them to be. I thank you for such a time as this, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing in and through this house, Lord. Lord, that this is a brotherhood here that's willing to hold each other, hold, willing to lift one another up, willing to reach down into the darkness, into the depths of one another's souls, and wrench out the things that hold us captive. Lord, I speak your peace over them. Make them men of peace, Lord Jesus, that destroys the authority that establishes disorder. We welcome order back into our society, beginning here in the name of Jesus. We're transforming a culture beginning here, right now, in the name of Jesus. We are planting a seed that will support a culture in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask for your wisdom and your revelation to becoming alive for these men. Each one of them, Lord, give them dreams, give them visions, give them understanding, give them wisdom in the hard times. Spirit of confusion, I rebuke you now in the name of Jesus. Our God is not a God of confusion. And these men are not men of confusion. They have the spirit of the living God inside them. And he gives them life. He inhabits them. He has appointed them to this time. He has has appointed them to the places that they are. He is establishing them in the name of Jesus. Enemy, you do not have a hold here. We will stand back to back, arm in arm, and we will fight. We will fight for our families. We will fight for our culture. We will fight for what the Lord is doing. Lord, I ask that you would bring us into the promised land together, Lord. I ask that our our sons and our daughters would inhabit the land that you have, Lord, as we fight to get us in there. Lord, for we know that you are the one with the victory. The victory is yours, Lord. Let us possess this land so they can inhabit it in Jesus' name. And Lord, give us the high places. In the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, guys. About face. As you were not. Today is a day of transition. Today is a day of transition. Remember, no man can do this by himself. But men, we are to go first. But we go first together. We go first as brothers. And God is going to change the world through what you are deciding to do here today. Bless you all. Happy Father's Day. Go enjoy ribs and whatever it is you're going to have. (laughs) If you need prayer for anything, please.